They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. We don't need to go populist left or populist right. We don't need to embrace neo-Marxism or neo-fascism, these disastrous movements from the 20th century. Turns out the answer is pretty much our Bill of Rights. Our story. Embrace freedom. That's the answer. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. We're here because we love liberty. And we're here because we hate injustice. We are here to save mankind. We are here to fight. Join us, the Libertarian Party, in perhaps the most exciting, grandest endeavor in history, the restoration of American liberty. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome to episode 57 of Decentralized Revolution, a podcast from the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. I'm Aaron Harris and I'm your host. Uh, A neat episode today about something going on uh, out in California. Uh, One of the great things about being on the board of the Mises Caucus and uh, just interacting with everybody is, especially over the last year, just seeing Uh, all the great things that are happening kind of spontaneously in all the state chapters of the Mises Caucus and and sometimes in the state affiliates of the Libertarian Party because Mises Caucus people are a big part of that or kind of in charge of it. Uh, So there's lots and lots of things. This is one of the, the, the biggest, I think it's a, it's a documentary film called unseen. It's a half an hour long uh, as, and as I say in the interview with the filmmakers, the only thing wrong with it was that it was 30 minutes long instead of, uh, you know, 90 or 100. Um, what it is, is um, Angela McArdle, I think, uh, was one of the people who had the idea for it. Of course, she's uh, one of our main organizers out in California for the Mises Caucus. And I think from the very beginning of the lockdowns uh, more than a year ago, now, of you know, of course, things were really bad in California. Um, Angela was uh, in contact with, seeking out, um, uh, hearing from people who were having their livelihoods threatened by this uh, lockdown. They said, hey, we need to somehow document this. I think it went through a couple of different ideas as far as how they were going to do it and what the product was going to be. And what we have is a, a 30 minute documentary called Unseen, uh, produced by the, the Mises Caucus media team of California. So, uh, again, just another example of uh, people not waiting for uh, detailed directions or ideas from Michael Heiss or uh, board members or people, you know, higher up the food chain, so to speak. Uh, they're coming out with these these ideas and doing these great things. And I'm just really glad to to have uh, Renita Sussman and Nick Nikaitis on today. They're the writer and the uh, director of this film. And um, we don't have, as I record this today, uh, it's not available for you to see. It's going to be uh, screened, I think, for the first time. The only scheduled screening right now is at the Anthem Film Festival, which is part of Freedom Fest. And uh, their slot in the Freedom Fest uh uh, lineup there is on Saturday, July 24th at 9.45 a.m. So if you want to support them and are going to Freedom Fest or you were kind of on the edge of whether or not you were going to go, this might put you over the top. I'll have a link to uh, the Freedom Fest uh, registration on the show notes page at Decentralized Revolution slash 57. Also, uh, you will find out where you can see it later after that. Uh, if you are subscribed to the Mises Caucus uh, email newsletter, and you can do that at takehumanaction.com. It's very important that you are linked up with us there. Um, I'm still, every day I wake up and log into Facebook, uh, I think that uh, our page is going to be gone. I don't have any special um, knowledge about that, but uh, we have to face that possibility. So if you want to stay in contact with us as we Uh, We've got some decentralized uh, online ways to communicate that are in the works. And uh, to to be part of that, uh, the best way is for you to give us an email address. 
you'll get, you know, usually about four emails a month. So it's not going to overload things for you. And it's going to have great information on stuff that you want to know, like uh, when and where you can see the documentary unseen. And I think you're going to want to see it even more after you hear my talk with Renita Sussman and Nick Nikides. Welcome to Decentralized Revolution, Renita Sussman. Hey. And Nick Nikides. Hello. Hey, it's uh, great to have you guys on. I watched, uh, I had watched uh, the film Unseen, uh, uh, a little bit of it a few weeks ago, uh, but I watched it in detail yesterday and uh, uh, really enjoyed it. I'll let whoever wants to take this. Um, where did the idea from the film come from and, and how did you get started? Uh, initially, I recall we were in a uh, LPMC California Zoom and Angela had asked if people wanted to uh, do anything on lockdown initiatives. So it kind of started with wanting to do something in that realm. And then from there, it kind of took off being that a lot of media people were getting in touch with Angela and, and we formed a media team and that's how it got started. So you guys were uh, part of the Mises caucus out there first and, and then this happened? I was. Okay. Nick? What about you? Yeah, I, um, I, I initially like spent the last year um, over the uh, lockdown dealing with uh, a lot of family issues. And then after I got back to Los Angeles in January, I was so upset about what was going on that I was like, I have to get together with other libertarians. So I joined some Zoom meetings and Angelo was in one of them. <clears throat> and I just like really voiced my concern about we have to do something. We have to tell these stories. And I she got me in touch with Renita and and some other people that were also getting involved in that in that way. And um it kind of went from there. I think all of us independently, since we work in this field already, kind of had this thought to do this already. Nick, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I think we all kind of independently were like, okay, this is enough. Like, we have to show the downside of lockdown because all they're doing is showing the downside of the disease, but mm -hmm. none of the downside of the policy that they're using to supposedly, you know, mitigate the disease. And also to hear the other side of it from people that could tell you, no, they haven't given us any justification for why they're doing this. Whereas when people watch the news, they just assume that that justification is there. So it was good to, to really get into the real story of it. So was there, uh, I think there's four main uh, sort of threads uh, in the film of different businesses. Where, did you uh, discover one of those first and then find the others? Uh, Again, where did once you wanted to do something about it? I think uh, looking at the closed business aspect was um, obviously a good way into this. Did you talk about another way into it? And how did you just decide on um, how did you run into the people who are who are featured in the film? Do you want to take it? Yeah. Um, so initially, I kind of joined somewhat late, but from what I understand. Angela got in contact with our first interviewee, which right. was Sharon Dallas. And um, an initial interview was done there. It was kind of a little more, um, a little more loose, I suppose. We I had a meeting. Content. We had a Mises meeting at her restaurant and we kind of planned to interview her a little bit and we interviewed her a little bit there, but then when Nick came in, we, we went further. Yeah. I, I came in and was like, let's, really because i come from a background working on like television shows and and uh feature films and um working on film sets for the last eight years or so and i just was like let's really up the ante on this and like make it really you know refined and like as you know somewhat cinematic and so i would i kind of just you know wanted to see if we could you know, do another interview, but like bring out the cinema lights, bring out the like real professional level stuff and um, see if we can make something that look really, really good. And um, that was initially supposed yeah. to be like social I, media. Oh, go ahead. Right. I just remember after that first day when we shot, when I, when I left after I saw everything that Nick 
brought, I got really excited. I'm like, this is gonna, this is really gonna be good. So that kind of really built momentum to start with the other people. Yeah, it's uh, when you're working on a, a project and you have other people who know what they're doing, and you start to see a little bit of that product. And the the film looks great. I have a little bit of experience in this uh, field, and that's you know I think sometimes as libertarians we uh, kind of sometimes we rush into things and just get something out there because we want to have a the hot take and because we're passionate about it. But you know, taking the um, the time to, to do a quality, uh, product, uh, it, it really makes a big difference. Um, so, and let, let's step back one second. So, uh, Renita, you're the credit as the writer on this and people may not necessarily know, uh, we, we know what a writer for the Sopranos, uh, would do, right. Uh, they have to make everything up. Um, what does a writer on a documentary do? So um, when we shoot our um, interviews, we get a transcript of that whole interview. So we have it all on paper. And then um, I sat down with Nick and just on paper on my own, I, you know, we went through and with this type of story, it's a bit easier because there's a chronology already laid down in place for you. So what we did was we, tried to interweave introducing these people with basically just the chronology of it. And we, you know, we want to start with their backstory just to get everyone equated with them, get them a little invested with them as people, and then talk about their business to show you what they put into their business. And then we got on with the lockdown chronology and then kind of left off with like, where is this all going? Yeah, you know, we we were trying to follow that classic hero's journey, which what what people have been going through this past year for is has been a, a hero's journey where, you know, everything's kind of going stable. And then all of a sudden this event takes place and then you're sent down and you have to like try to work your way up. And so that what we have in these people really did follow that sort of path. And we were hoping by the end of the film that we showed that they were on their way back up and out. And, um, but it's still kind of left it as a question because, you know, at the end of the day, are these govern are these governors, are these local authorities going to try to do it again? Right. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about each of the uh, people who are featured in the film. You mentioned Sharon Dallas. Let's start with her. Um, she's owned the Pepper Tree Cafe there in Glendora. What, what was it since the nineties? Yeah. 1997, she, uh, her and her husband opened um, the Pepper Tree Cafe, which is kind of like a, um, sort of diner she describes it as like a cheers type of place with they don't serve alcohol but they it's kind of a place where the whole community sort of gathers and a lot of she gets a lot of regulars and so they they really killed themselves for the first yeah like 10 years i think she described it as trying to get that business up and going and sacrificed a lot to do that so it was a classic small family business and she describes it as literally her and her husband living the American dream. So yeah, what I liked about um, her telling her story, their story about um, them starting the restaurant is that she specifically said that they didn't want to be dependent on the system. And I felt like that really fit well with, um, you know, our, our documentary and our group that we're trying to, you know, work with them. So I really uh, like that. Yeah. Uh, the, another really um, cool was the, the, uh, I forget the guy's name and I forget the restaurant, but the, uh, his parents were Israeli. Tell us about him. Uh, tall. He, he I, I like how everybody does have a different story because he was just getting open when the lockdown happened. So <laughs> that is, uh, was, was crazy. And it, a funny little story is, um, his dad's in the in the movie putting the they're putting the restaurant together and I was looking at his shirt and I realized that I knew his dad <laughs> he had come to my house and um done an inspection on a contractor who had messed up and like saved my ass so bad like I love that guy <laughs> so it was really cool that I was able to kind of give back 
and help his family. It's, it's just a really funny story. Right. And but, then, um, yeah. and then the, the other two, it's a gymnastics uh, studio. And then uh, the other guy, I think it was a, a restaurant. That was a really sort of, uh, that, 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 yeah, that story affected me a lot because of the circumstances of him coming out there. So tell, tell us uh, about the gymnastics uh, studio and, and then about the, the final subject. Well, it was, um, you know, finding interviewees in general in, in this like um, environment was kind of difficult because a lot of everything got kind of political. So it was kind of hard to just find people that were open to doing it like we actually tried to find a lot of immigrant businesses but a lot of immigrant business owners felt uncomfortable being interviewed because even though they were upset about what was going on that they didn't want to risk anything they didn't want to like be out in the open and exposed and so you know it was it was kind of difficult to 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 find these individuals um that were willing enough and upset enough and realizing like, Hey, this is really awful. And we need to do something about this, that they wanted to be able to tell their stories. But, um, the gym owner, I got her contact through, um, like a local, it's like Los Angeles has this, um, this like business association that gives small business loans and they, you know, they're kind of a resource for small businesses when they need, when they're in kind of trouble. And so a lot of people were calling into this um, association and I got her contact through there and she was, we, we did three restaurants already and we wanted to do something different. And one reason we thought she was such a great story. Uh, there's a few reasons is one, she, her husband is from China. And so he, came to this country to avoid, you know, the whole yeah. socialism, communism side of the side of things. And then um, because she, her clients are, you know, parents with children, we can see the effect of lockdowns on children and how, especially in gymnastics, which is incredibly competitive, for you to lose a year from gymnastics could be the end of your ability to get a scholarship, you know? And so witnessing that, witnessing their stories was like massive. Um, and then Matt, Matt, do you want, do you want to tell uh, Matt's story, Renita, or do you want me to go into that? You, you can go with that one. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt, Matt is great. Um, I learned about him through some other um, some other like anti lockdown groups, and he kind of came to came together as like a a real sort of hero in Ventura County. Like him and a bunch of other people formed this organization, and they call it Brave, and it's basically a coalition of different businesses. Which is, in my opinion, the way we make sure this doesn't ever happen again is that businesses come together and form a pact or a coalition, as they say, to make sure that this never happens again, that they will all go in and into it together. And if they ever try to lock down, all of them will stay open. If right. all of them stay open, then none of this will happen. But because he was kind of the tip of the spear with a bunch of other restaurants, I mean, they had every legal action thrown at them and they have a great lawyer that managed to fight back against this really, it's actually a great case study that I think people across the country need to look into because she managed to trying to remember the, the legal terminology, but was um, trying to get the, the local council people um, recalled and the health inspector recalled. I think they were because of that pursuit of because she was going so hard at them, they eventually threw out all the lawsuits against the restaurants and other business owners that were trying to stay open. Yep. And they won. They won in the end. <laughs> and there I I went to some of their meetings and it is incredible the amount of like community that they've created there. Yeah. It like makes you want to it honestly makes me want to cry because these yeah. people are like care so much about their businesses and their community and the people that they employ 
and is yeah, it's a great story. So um, I, I think it's really important what they're doing because um, over near me in Burbank, we have like a lone restaurant that stayed open and you know, they're not in our documentary, but things really didn't go well for them. They stayed open for a while and it was, you know, kind of going fine. And then um, the city padlocked their door. And so they took the lock off and they stayed open. Well, it basically culminated in the city coming and building a fence around that restaurant. And now every other restaurant's open, but because they didn't obey the rules, now they're shut still. Yeah. And a lot of it also has to do with not only the you know legal pressures, but the social pressures around. So if you can get multiple businesses to come together and agree, agree to stay open, that can kind of change that perception in the community. You know? yeah. What were some of the challenges uh, uh, of shooting this? So, so when when exactly were you shooting, and uh, were you getting you know people uh, you know driving by yelling at you like why are you out you know did uh, uh, did uh, law enforcement anything like that what, what what was actually filming during all this that uh, what was that like? Um, well. Honestly, because it was kind of a self-selected situation where the business owners were kind of on our side, that they were very, um, very uh, open to us coming in and working inside of their businesses. And I think that's what protect us. If we're out on the street filming stuff and trying to do interviews on the street, then yeah, we might get in a little more of an issue. But because we're inside of a private business that they can't really... You know, there's nothing, we're kind of protected by that. And so we didn't really have any issues with like authorities at all. Um, and, you know, we, we did everything by the book, um, posted all kinds of signs about, uh, you know, gaining permission. If you enter these premises, you will be filmed and, and that sort of thing. And so we didn't really run into to much of that. A lot of the challenges, honestly, was just scheduling because it was all volunteers. Um, so we had to find that that worked on this. So we were, I have friends in the business that were sympathetic um, to our cause that aren't people, they aren't in the Libertarian Party, but they're upset about what was going on. And so I luckily, <laughs> you know, in the film business, it's like, it, it's almost behind closed doors that you just speak about these things like, oh, I don't agree with the current political atmosphere. I don't agree with this. And like you'd have to listen almost for these like certain words people use that kind of tip you off like, oh, you don't agree with any of this. And luckily, I think I could, kept my ears perked for long enough to know the people that would be willing to come out and help. And so I managed to get a few people to do that with me. Um, and but yeah, it was a scheduling thing, but the people that did come out were amazing. Multiple people donated hours and hours of their time and their equipment, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment that they just lent and we used during the shoot. And um, they just did it out of their own desire to say something about what was happening. Like, this is wrong, you know? And so they lent all of that to them, to, to us. And it was it's really grateful for that. Um, so yeah, they, but that was probably the most difficult thing was the scheduling, to be honest, just getting everyone in the same place, same time and kind of following the, the proper protocols when it comes to filming on location and making sure everyone signs releases that needs to be, that needs to sign a release. And, and so, um, yeah, I didn't really, nothing, nothing with the authorities, I'd say nothing really happened with that. What's something that you noticed um, that all of the people you talked to um, had in common? What was it that made them uh, have the the courage to uh, to do this? Whereas probably a lot of other businesses in very similar situations, people didn't quite handle it like that. What's the common thread you see in, in all the the people in this film? I think part of it is politics. You know, I mean, one person isn't necessarily in the same as the others, but he's not that different either, you know? 
Maybe so, just yeah, speak I, to more of like their personalities though. Yeah. Um, Renita was on set for one of the shoots. She's, you know, our editor handling everything on the back end did ama- you know, amazing job doing that. But I was like there on set with them for all four of the interviews. So I kind of got to get to know them maybe in a little more intimate uh, setting. And they, um, I would say, honestly, it is probably the po- political thing that seems to be the common thread. What, and she mentioned one of, one of them was a little more, um, towards the middle, mm-hmm. but a lot of them were probably more conservative people. And they just, this is one of their values that they cherish is their, is their civil liberties, their ability to be, you know, make an income and feed their families is like paramount. And I would say that's one reason why when you get further outside of Los Angeles, you start to see more people that are willing to stand up and say no. But once you're inside, there's like a ton of social pressure to stay locked down, even though they could be like really, really upset with what's going on. They're also worried about their clientele who think that things should be shut down. So if they open, they could lose their clientele. And um, that was one of the concerns of one of our interviewees is that like, I don't want to look to my clientele like I'm not like a part of their culture. And so that I that is so significant, I think, to this whole thing was was what tribe you belong to and what that tribe says you should be doing right now. And so, you know, I think we found some people that are part of the other tribe, honestly, right. the tribe that says stay open. And, and I think that sort of tribalist aspect of it. Uh, I think that ties into what you said earlier uh, and one one of the characters in the film, not characters, but subjects of the film say um, with the, when the businesses got together, you know, that um, in a place like Los Angeles, if you're anti-lockdown, maybe more conservative or libertarian, uh, you're a fan, you know, concerned about family and, you know, that small business sort of ethic. If everyone else around you doesn't do that, it's very hard. But then when you start seeing other people stand up, then, then that, that, that must've been a a very liberating and uh, empowering feeling for, for the people who, who found each other through this. Yeah. I think uh, Matt says that too. It's like Sharon says she just got sick of it. And she's like, I'm, you know, dealing with the outdoor dining and everything. She's like pissed already, you know, Um, Matt, obviously they're all mad. But he said that he had seen other people starting to do it and kind of saw, you know, they were defying it. And, and that kind of pushed him over the edge. Yeah. Did um, let, let, Let's talk a little bit more uh, about each of you and, and your, what you do. Uh, you're both kind of working in this industry. Uh, Renia, let's start with you. What, what do you do normally and how has the COVID stuff uh, affected your uh, career over the past 15 months? Um, so I edit mainly in uh, reality shows and documentaries. And uh, I've been doing it since about 2006, 2007. I grew up in Massachusetts and went to school out there. So um, for me, I was out of work for a while. And so that really pissed me off. Um, And then I I became lucky enough to work from home. And so I've been doing that ever since. And, you know, I'm very thankful about that. But I'm careful not to be thankful for really anything in this. When people walk by a restaurant and they're like, oh, look, people are inside. That's so great. Isn't that awesome? I'm like, they're supposed to be in there. That's we don't, (laughs) you know. Um, But and then on the. For me, like still being someone that works from home, I still care about those people that can. And that's, you know, I I had asked Sharon when we were there, I'm like, Sharon, how do you feel about people that work from home? And, you know, kind of their feeling that we're all in this together. And she's like, we're not all in this together. If you're at home collecting a paycheck, we're not the same. And, um, you know, I happen to still be pissed for those people that weren't able to do that. Nick, what about you? What's your professional experience through this been? 
Um, well, I've, I've lived in LA since like 2011 and been working on, uh, as part of a camera crew member, um, since uh, 2013 and I've been working on like a lot of narrative, uh, film, like feature films and TV shows, commercials and things like that. So, um, yeah, they're they're uh, so I've just spent a ton of time on set. And when they announced the lockdowns, I I mean, I was in the middle of working on a show and it was we started people started getting phone calls on set, which is like not you don't have, it's like very rude to just get yeah. phone calls and start picking up phones like in the middle of it. And our first AD got a call from his wife that the groceries we're running out of food. <laughs> and I remember looking at everyone like, let's just wrap this now and just get out of here. Like it, it was an all, it was a night shoot too. And so that, that morning after we wrapped, I remember me and another camera assistant, we all like went to the local grocery store and it was like a mad dash. As soon as it opened, there was a huge crowd. There's like an escalator that goes up into the grocery store and people were going up the down escalator in order to beat other people to get to the like non-perishable food and it like the rice was gone the spaghetti was gone like everything was gone and i knew right there like uh it was like okay like this is all shutting down i better get on unemployment it's like it's so i got on unemployment really quickly and i had already had an experience with that before in my life it was difficult i'll tell you i mean because as a camera crew member you're freelance you know, you don't have like one employer and you have to like list, it's like so I'd annoying. list like 25 different employers, but I l luckily I had that experience so I could do yeah. that like really quickly. But there was a lot of people who have never done it before and they, they ended up on the back end of this unemployment line. And so they ended up with like nothing in the end. And um, so, but that same week, my, my mother was sick and she went into hospice care. So I just bailed from L.A. and went to Indiana. I spent like six months there and eventually got back to L.A. and started working on a new show. But it was all under COVID protocols. And so we were wearing masks like 12 hours a day in every type of condition in over 100 degree heat and then below freezing because almost the entire shoot was on location. It was like two months in very intense situation, breathing through masks all day. Um, it was insane. I mean, it was honestly insane. And it's still it's still going on today. It's I mean, there's every film crew has to wear that has to wear a mask all day. They can't take it off until they eat lunch. And it's all kind of ridiculous too. Like often they'll like we have these COVID officers that go around initially with these giant, like we call them lightsabers, like they're six feet long. Just if we ever stand in line, they would go around and start pushing this lightsaber between us and saying, you need to back up, you need to back up. And then they're telling me I can't wear a certain type of mask because of my facial hair. So I have to shave my facial hair. Otherwise I have to change the mask. And I'm like, and now we're discovering and then they were like scrubbing down all the equipment too like you need a person that's like solely or their whole job is to is to sanitize equipment now and you know we've discovered oh that it's not how it's transmitted but all this time and energy was wasted doing this no there's just been no critical thinking you know it's not it's not about trade-offs or about um no one's considering the cost benefit no one's considering like the risk profiles of all kinds of different activities we i mean it's dangerous working on a set there's all kinds of things we do that's dangerous like i've nearly been run over by a car multiple times working on set just being near the road is probably more dangerous than covid just working in and around like intersections and roads and on and off of these giant vehicles like the insert cars that you know we shoot you know lots i mean i hanging off the back of a trailer constant like all the time and some of these shows that are end up and working on you know in cars and around cars and stuff and but here we are like outside all day like for most of the shoots yet we still have to wear masks and it was just and we don't know what these masks are made of we have no idea like now we're discovering that at least with children they're breathing in massive amounts of CO2 that could be damaging their brains. 
So I, so anyway, uh, it, it, it's been really interesting because they, they make us do all kinds of safety classes in order to be eligible to work on set. And some of them are respiratory safety classes where you have to learn all about the different types of respirators and what they're made for and what they're not made for. And if you don't wear them properly, then they lose all of their epic, uh, efficacy. And I'm like, guys, what about all these classes we already did about respiratory? <laughs> and like, you're just going to ignore that? Like, it was insane. I just thought like, don't you remember these classes about respirators and how they have to be fitted properly in order to make them work and they have to be used for their purpose and not just like used as some, and then you read the label on these boxes of masks and they say not designed to prevent the spread of uh, respiratory disease. And you're like, then why are we doing this? Like, it's just, you know, it's, but you know, it's a signal thing. People really do believe that, Hey, like this, I'm doing my part. That's what I've noticed mostly is like, even if it doesn't, we can't prove that it works. It's, it's enough to know that it looks like we're trying to do something. And that's what really counts in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. And that's what like Tal mentioned in the movie. He's like, I think that yeah. they did this largely just to be like, look, we're, we're trying to do something, you know, just to save face for people not knowing if it's really the right thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask kind of what, um, uh, what your hope for people, um, uh, seeing this film is, but, and I think it has something to do with the title of the movie unseen. Where did you mm -hmm. get that title and, and what, what do you want people to, to take away from this? I'll let Nick speak to the title in a second, but I, we had both initially talked about like, uh, we need to try to appeal to people emotionally because we're we've clearly shown that that's how a lot of people are driven, and that's what caused this to happen in the first place. So we want to kind of attack that same beast from a different angle. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I mean, as you guys well know, libertarians that are are in our circles well know is that. Um, we can, we can talk to logic all day long and we can make the best argument, but people are not moved by logic. They're moved by feelings. <clears throat> and, um, so much of someone's willingness to accept like an argument is how they feel about you, not whether your argument is sound. <laughs> so I, I think that goes a long way. And so um yeah me and renita and angela and the various people in the media group were like we need to speak to people's feelings and and show them like this is what's going on and we found some great interviewees that really told that story that really human side of the story that was com being completely lost um especially in the mainstream media the only human thing we were allowed to hear about is people that are dying from covid but we weren't allowed to hear about people whose lives have been destroyed by the policies um and i think the ultimate argument we're trying to make is like is the cure worse than the disease and i think us libertarians would say yes it is like I don't think that the cure has achieved anything to mitigate the disease. All it did was compound the the pain that all of our society has been feeling over the last year. And um, so, but the, the title, The Unseen, you know, came from the, uh, you know, the uh, Bastiat sort of idea that there's the scene and the unseen. And I know that the unseen is usually refers to, you know, the things that are not created. Um, but even in this sense, I feel like the unseen was like people not even knowing what was happening to these businesses. Yeah. And it's like, now we know what, and we just wanted to show that. Yeah. And my, the, the biggest thing was like, we need to document what, the damage. If we don't document the damage, then no one will ever know. And then the, the victors will be able to write the history books. And they're already trying to do that too. I mean, they're already... You know, writing children's books with Fauci as the hero. And it's like, you know, like Tom Woods says, like, we can't allow that. We have to put out our history of what actually happened. That means telling both sides of the story. Like, it's like yeah. telling the, about the Vietnam War and only from the American perspective. And it's like, why, like, why don't you show the Vietnamese perspective? 
And that's part of the reason why that war eventually ended was because we could actually see what was happening to the, we were seeing the death and destruction, which prior to that, I mean, you know, the American people wouldn't see the death and destruction from war, like in real time, they'd have to like wait for the bodies to come home. And like, I guarantee that the authorities will do their best to try to hide the bodies. Like they don't want people to know just how many businesses have been destroyed, how many lives have been destroyed. And as long as, as long as we um, allow that, like they'll get away with this and they'll get away with it again. And so we have to expose that. And it's, you know, it's a risk that Brandon yeah. and I are taking. I, yeah, I think that what was, good was to be able to talk to these people and get some specifics because you know we were able to find out um because when you look at all the restaurants that are still open and they're doing takeout and you're like oh, okay they're still in business we were able to get the specifics about the numbers and sharon had said it's about 25 percent of your normal you know or no maybe she said 10 percent. yeah 10 percent. yeah like really low and i was surprised to hear that and I think that's really important to, to get that information that normal people just don't have. And for Matt to say, no, they never gave me any science or data to justify this, you know, right. to get those real answers. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, one th the only thing I, I really didn't like about the uh, uh, documentary was the fact that it's kind of short, um, uh, which obviously there's probably probably reasons for that so yeah. why, why don't you talk about that why uh why is it the link that is is there plans to do more uh yeah. on this uh, let's talk about that uh well initially we had thought that we would just tell these people's stories and the first video we did we actually um had at the tom woods event at uh patty's station and it was about a five minute video and it was tall story so originally we thought we were gonna do just little short videos of each of these people. Um, but then we kind of got the offer to submit to the Anthem Film Festival at Freedom Fest. So, and we already had these interviews planned. We are like, why don't we just put them all together into a documentary? And um, it's basically the, the time limit is what's keeping it so short because we have like Nick was saying, we, when we got Amy, we wanted to have a diversity in the types of businesses that we showed. And um, we had ideas to show all different kinds of people and not even businesses like people who couldn't go to their addiction meetings yep. or couldn't see their loved one at a hospital, yep. you know? So um, we might possibly do that in the future. Yeah. Um, what, what other sort of, um, uh, unanswered questions do you guys have from this? How, how are, how are the people in the film doing now? Um, yeah, there, there's, there's loose ends, but that's kind of, I think kind of the point is that we're still kind of in the middle of this and they could come back and do this. They could try to come back and do this, um, uh, at any time, Nick, what, what, what kind of things would you like to maybe do related to this going forward? Um, yeah, like Renina said, we, you know, this kind of started off as, as like a social media project for the LPMC, and we were just going to roll out a few interviews here and there over the course of the last few months. But then, um, because we kind of decided to make it into, uh, to submit it to a film festival, make it a documentary, it, um, it meant that we had to really buckle down and concentrate on making a, something that could be shown at a doc or at a film festival. And so we've been concentrating on that mostly this, this whole last uh, few months. Um, and it's been like a marathon. I mean, the fact that we were able to, or it's been like a sprint, honestly, like we've been able to turn this around and turn into an actual like short documentary that looks great in the the very small amount of time with our like four thousand dollar budget um has really been amazing i think i i would give a lot of that credit to renita because usually editing and documentary is the thing that takes the longest and she was able to bust that out like so quickly and um but like moving forward we we i've kept kept up with um 
with Matt. Um, and he is still like very strong in the Brave Coalition. Um, and I think, you know, like I said before, I think that has to be the bit, the model for everyone moving forward, every business owner. There needs to be some sort of coalition to prevent this from happening, like a grassroots thing. And um, the others, I need to honestly I need to check back up with them. I'm planning on giving them like a Blu-ray copy of the of the documentary, and um, and we may even do some some screenings. One for Matt's organization. It's you know, Renee and I don't have. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I have very little film festival and like producer. Um, um, experience so a lot of this is very new to me so i'm kind of learning as i'm a lot of this has been very much learning as i'm going and it's been a whirlwind and so um you know getting back in touch with everyone that did the interview i'm going to be doing that very shortly and getting them and showing them what we yeah i feel like we were kind of waiting until we have something to show them you know yeah, yeah. it's been like the timing has been really uh yeah, you know, these these deadlines have been very quick on us, and I think Joe yeah. and Skousen would probably agree that like we've yeah. been kind of hitting every deadline right on the day because yeah. we have had to turn this thing around very quickly in order to get it to the film festival. So yeah, so you're talking about the Anthem Film Festival that's going to be at at Freedom Fest. Uh, talk about that and how else are you? Uh, trying to get it out there uh, for for people to see what's the what's the plan uh, uh, going up to the film festival and and beyond that. I think for now we're we're mainly focused on getting people to the festival to see it there, and um, you know we're kind of waiting to see how that goes to see where the the movie's going to end up. Nick. Yeah, um, yeah, I think. You know, like I said before, we're kind of in this position where, sorry, I have some dogs moving in. Uh, we're in this position where we're kind of figuring out as we're going the best way of distributing the film because, you know, it's not like a traditional distribution because it is a short film. It's not like one where you're like, okay, we'll give it to iTunes or give it to Apple or give it to Amazon. It's, um, something that's meant for the LPMC and it's kind of meant as, a, as somewhat of a recruiting tool as well. So we just need to have that discussion with people and, and figure out what's the best way we can utilize this. And then um, also Angela um, wanted to use what we've shot as a means to um, lobby our local governments um, to make sure that this doesn't happen again, just so that we can show the stories um to to the to the local authorities so they can understand like hey like when you say you're shutting down a business it's not just like this simple thing it's not just like oh there's no pain on the other side of that there's no consequences on the other side of that just because you don't feel pain in your decision doesn't mean that there isn't pain yeah. and here here's the pain so you have to face that now you have to confront like each time i do this this will happen and is that worth it and is this actually going to solve the problem or are you just pretending to solve a problem and just so you can you know say to your voters that you're doing something when in fact what you're doing is accomplishing nothing i think so. um you know when you you go out you can see these restaurants that are clearly shut down and not opening back up so you know i but, people should kind of be aware already and i i don't remember what the numbers were was it like 60 percent of businesses that shut down are not going to open back up yeah i think something something where around that you yeah. know it's something about the the american entrepreneurial spirit i feel like there's a lot at least in la i've seen you know businesses open back up i'm seeing businesses move back into vacated um you know, yeah places but it's it's those places that were used to be there right no longer there and i i did a walk because i for the poster i took photos of like closed signs in hollywood and i did a walk down the street and i was looking for closed signs and funny enough i didn't find that many closed signs what i found was tons of for lease signs mm -hmm. but we want we thought closed probably told the story a little bit better so we uh 
it was incredible just the sheer amount of releases on like one of the busiest streets in the country i'd say business busiest tourist areas in the country yeah. um it's pretty incredible and you know no one's counting those no one's saying no one's putting the ticker like right. how many businesses and how many how many years of of life have been lost yeah. up on the ticker and cnn that's not happening they only have one metric they care about it's the one that you know well, you would think that, um, and I, I used to be a newspaper reporter, and you would think that a reporter or a TV producer would look at this pandemic and and see all the stories are about you know the hospitals and what Fauci is saying and the 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 you know the the curve and all that stuff, and you would think that some of these people would say, well, let's cover another aspect of this. And that's, it's such an obvious thing, but so few people did it. Why, why do you think that is? Why aren't other <laughs> people in journalism or in filmmaking, you know, what, why, why would you not want to tell this story? There's a clear agenda and they're all just part of that. I mean, and that's been going on long before this. Yeah. I mean. So yeah. go ahead, Nick. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I honestly think it is a tribal thing. Are you part of Team Blue or are you part of Team Red? Yep. And if you're part of Team Blue, you go along with what Team Blue says, even though your team could be actively damaging your livelihood. You have to trust them because if you don't trust them and their legitimacy is threatened, then your identity could be threatened along with it. Like now what now you're kind of out in the open. You're no longer you no longer have a tribe to associate with. Now, what are you? And that's very painful to lose your identity. I think a lot of people are just latching on to that identity with that's associated with a political party. And the political party says this, you do this. And you can't like go and confront your friends and say, like, oh, I you know, I don't agree with this. Like now, now your social group might be a threat. Like, and these are the people you depend on. This could be your family. So you just don't you don't say anything, you just go along. I think probably 80% of people are just going along to get along. Yeah. I mean, there's the 10% that are pushing everything in one direction and the other 10% that are trying to resist. And who, wherever the, you know, the the water flows easiest is where most people are gonna go. I, I think it's, we've it's seen easier. that, yes, more than ever. You know, that's been made so clear in the past year. It just brought everything to the forefront. Yeah, at the beginning of this, um, I would have thought that there would be a greater percentage uh, of Americans that would go for liberty over security. And uh, I, I didn't think it was maybe even a majority back then, but I had no idea the the tables had turned this much since, uh, uh, you know, I, I still remember, you know, I, I grew up in the late seventies and eighties and it was a different country then. Um, and, uh, last 20 years have, uh, a lot of stuff has, has really changed. And I think that, um, uh, there's a line in, in the film, uh, where, um, what, what's the, the, the man's name? He, uh, his parents were from Israel. Tall. Okay. Tall says, you know, Hey, you know, they came to America and he's like, I thought, basically this was the place where you could come and live your life the way you wanted to, but I'm coming to Is realize that, that it yeah. may not be. Yeah. Not in, in, in 2020. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, he, he definitely experienced that his parents came here with basically nothing and through sheer will and entrepreneurship built a lot yep. and, um, and helped him in his business. And then, you know, Amy and her husband, same thing. And then just to have that taken away is just really brutal. And then to have so many people in your community kind of just stand by and watch it happen. Yeah. But then at the same time, it has brought together people who are against it and are like-minded. So it has had that effect in bringing those people together. And I believe that, you know, we are stronger when we work together. Yep. So that's a good thing. Well, and I, I'm really just really pleased to have you guys as part of the Mises caucus. And it, it, we're getting to the point where we're, there's so many of us now that 
we don't necessarily know what we're all doing. And so it's nice to, <laughs> to see something like this uh, happen. And we teased this a little bit on our social media. And I sent out an email to the caucus uh, a couple of days ago. And I've gotten a lot of response in both places. People are saying, hey, you know, where's the link? Where can I see this? So uh, tell them, uh, I know not everybody can make it up to South Dakota, but that's one part of it. So the, the film festival and then other ways that, uh, that people are going to be able to see this. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to be screened um, July 24th at um, Anthem Film Festival in South Dakota. And uh, that's a Saturday at 9.45 a.m. Um, I think there's going to be a series of short documentaries that are going to be screened at that time. And then we're going to have a panel immediately afterwards that I'll be speaking in. Um, and then uh, later there's going to be a panel at 11, I'll be speaking. And then Renita has a panel she's going to be speaking in as well. But kind of in the same way that, you know, traditional releases work, like we wanted to have this first exploitation window, as I guess they call it, like the theat uh, theatrical, so that people you know, want to go to the film festival. We want to make sure people go to the film festival. And then I think after that, we'll, I think we'll be a discussion with the Mises caucus, uh, maybe uh, some of the top, you know, top people in that um, about how we'd like to exhibit the rest, you know, this film to, to a wider audience, um, whether we'd like to maybe do some screenings for some local groups, maybe for some businesses like, like uh, Matt's coalition, like similar thing, or whether we would just want to do a wide sort of just online yeah. distribution. I think eventually it will be online. I don't know if, you know, maybe if it will be on a, a Mises page somewhere, but I think that will happen. It's just that you kind of want to go through these, steps before you release it to everybody it's kind of the way that it normally goes right right um so um is there a um i think there's a trailer coming out uh in a couple of days uh, uh, we're recording this on monday july 5th so sometime this week i think you said the trailer will be available yeah okay so we will it might be out by the time this goes right. up um so i'll have it on the show notes page um, you know, you can look at the, uh, all the Mises caucus social stuff. And then, uh, uh, if you're not already subscribed to the, you know, the Mises caucus newsletter, just go to take and everything yeah. big that happens with the film will definitely, uh, feature it, uh, in, in all those places. Yeah. And we're really excited to, um, do other projects moving forward. So this is really just the beginning for the Mises media team. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, I'm I've got some ideas myself uh, already, so yeah, I'll I'll, I'll shoot those to you. Please, and, we're uh, open to anything from you know anybody. We're you know you're all part of the the group and the community. Yeah, and I can also say that uh, um, anybody who maybe wants to be a part of this, um, um, you know, can reach out to you guys directly, or can you know reach out Angela. to me and I'll oh yeah, yeah. or Angela, me, who whomever. Yeah. Um, you probably and, have more time than she does. So. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Angela is. Uh, what, what what was it like working with her? She's great. I mean, uh, the first time I met her in person, like we we really hit it off, and um, you know, we talked about doing some projects, and she's just been so great about bringing everyone together, and um, you know, letting us kind of do our thing. And um, I don't know, I like her a lot. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, she, um, I, you know, I have phone calls with her every so often and she's very receptive, like a, a person that you can just talk to and just express, you know, concerns about this or that thing and just kind of make plans and everything. And she's a great leader, honestly, like she's very calm, collected, um, enthusiastic, I, enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, like she, she knows how to deal with controversy. She knows how to deal with like tough times and kind of high drama and stuff she's the kind of calm cucumber cool cucumber <laughs> in that situation so we really like that but she's also giving us like goals to meet deadlines and meet and so she she kind of acts a bit like that you know person with the whip behind it. let's go we gotta get this right. going. <laughs> so. i i can i definitely see both sides of that in her so 
Um, well, it, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on, uh, like I say, on the show notes page, will be all the ways that you can engage with this is, is, do you guys have a website for the film yet or not, not yet? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's no website. Um, like I said before, it's kind of one of these things where it was just a quick social media that expanded yep. all of a sudden into a, or, you know, a documentary. Yeah. That, yeah. And so we've all kind of been like, well, should we do this? Should we do that? Nope, I think no we want to also have it focus towards Mises as much as possible. So, okay. Yeah. We'll definitely, we'll put it up on the, the caucus website and all that. So yeah, it's uh, early stages of all this um, uh, that I, I don't think people realize that even when the film is done, you're still, there's still lots of uh, stuff to do. And, and uh, I hope oh, yeah. that, I hope that some doors open up and uh, that as many people can see this as possible because uh, it, it really does. It looks great. Uh, it, it, uh, I, there's, it's top quality work. Um, you would not know that it was done on, what'd you say? A $4,000 budget. Um, that's and how much time, right, Nick? Yeah, it's is I would say I kind of budgeted it out. It was probably it was four thousand dollars out of pocket that we got reimbursed for. Um, but then like I'd probably say it was not worth eighty thousand dollars after like trying if we considered paying for right. all of it. Right. You know? All the time that we put into it and, and whatnot. And and then uh, what what do you think the time frame was for uh from start to finish? We started shooting it, I think in late February. And then we we had to submit by May, middle of May. I think was when we had to yeah. submit it. And that's with so, us working too at the same yeah. time. Yeah, so. we're all working professionals. So. Yeah, well, it, the, the working professional stuff it definitely comes out in in the film. It's uh, I can't recommend it more highly, and I'll do everything I can to promote it. And uh, thank you. Yeah, th thanks for coming on the show, and thanks for for being part of the Mises Caucus and for this great film. There you have it. I'd like to thank Renita Sussman and Nick Nikaitis for their time and for making this great short film on a really important topic. Of course, thanks also to Angela McArdle and everyone on the California Mises Caucus media team who put in the hard work to do this. Uh, that's how they kept it to such a small budget um, and how it, it looks so good is because a lot of people donated, contributed their time. We'll have a link to the trailer for Unseen on the show notes page at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 57. Uh, it's supposed to be released as of today, uh, Wednesday, July 7th. Uh, as of right now, that'll be the only uh, place uh, and time that you can uh, see uh, the trailer it is all you can see of the film uh, until the Freedom Fest uh, Anthem Film Festival. Their screening is going to be Saturday, July 24th at 9.45 a.m. And, of course, you have to be on the uh, the best way to, to know when you can see the full film. If you can't make it to South Dakota, is to sign up for the Mises Caucus email newsletter at takehumanaction.com. Thanks to Dave vs. Goliath for all the music you hear on Decentralized Revolution. And thanks to everyone who subscribes to that email list and gives to Mises Pack at TakeHumanAction.com and everyone who shares, rates, reviews, and subscribes to Decentralized Revolution. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.